Tonight on KPBS Evening Edition, the shooting at a Sikh temple in Wisconsin is resonating in San Diego. Sikhs in Poway and Escondido are now looking at ways to build bridges with those who don't understand their faith. And after nearly 40 years, the Marines honor one of their own who went missing in action. And from the KPBS Investigations Desk, our Follow the Money election series on how campaign mailers affect the election. And a closer look at the San Diego Museum of Art's link to an elaborate hoax by the Yes Men, who claim it's okay to lie to reveal the truth. And plans to put 1,000 electric car charging stations around the county are behind schedule. We'll tell you why. KPBS Evening Edition starts now. Hi, good evening. Thanks for joining us. I'm Dwayne Brown. Police have stepped up patrols at several Sikh temples in Southern California after a deadly attack in Wisconsin. A gunman identified as an Army veteran shot six people at a temple outside of Milwaukee. About 600 families are practicing Sikhs in San Diego County. And one priest from a temple in Poway apparently knew two of the victims killed in Sunday's massacre. 40-year-old Wade Page reportedly opened fire without saying a word. Authorities say he's the former leader of a white supremacist heavy metal band. Two of the priests killed at the temple were friends and colleagues of Pratip Singh, a priest at a temple in Poway. He says one of the priests has two young children, very young. He couldn't even... They've been here a couple of months. That was it since they moved to the U.S. And he, he says yesterday he just couldn't even eat food. He, he was having a hard time kind of keeping it down. He, he just thinking of them over and over again. Amar Deep Singh Man with the San Diego Sikh Foundation says he doesn't want to speculate on the gunman's motive and thinks we should let authorities piece together what happened. If, if somebody like this does something irrational in this way where he takes it out on innocent people, it's not good, no matter who it happens to, whether it's Sikhs, whether it's Hindus, whether it's Muslims, whether it's Christians. He says we have to move forward and build better bridges of understanding because Sikhs are often wrongly labeled as terrorists or Muslims. When this took place yesterday, I'm sure most of America was saying, well, I wonder what a Sikh temple is, I wonder what a Sikh Gurdwara is, even though it's the fifth biggest religion in the world. So that means that we've got to big job to do to help make people understand better the teachings of our religion. There are five to six hundred Sikhs living in San Diego County and they worship at two temples, one in Poway, another in Escondido. Most Sikhs live in Punjab, India, where their monotheistic religion was founded in the 15th century. They believe in one God and equality for all people. Man says it's gut-wrenching to see Shootings like this and their heartfelt condolences go out to people who lost loved ones. There will be a prayer service for the victims and the public is invited Wednesday night from 6.30 until 8 at the Sikh Temple, San Diego. The address is on the screen. It's located in Poway. State agencies are now under stricter rules for tracking their money, so says Governor Jerry Brown. Even though a special audit found no discrepancies to match the $54 million found stashed at the Parks Department, the State Assembly is holding an oversight hearing on Thursday to review the findings. But H.D. Palmer with the Finance Department says there's no need for a legislative fix. The State Attorney General is also investigating the accounting matter. A record number of real estate agents lost their licenses in California last year. The Department of Real Estate says more than 1,100 licenses were revoked, suspended, or surrendered by agents. The DRE says the collapse of the real estate market is to blame, with scammers preying on stressed-out homeowners. The falling market led Republican presidential candidate Mitt Romney to ask for property tax relief on his La Jolla mansion. County records show Romney and his wife asked the county to reset the home's value in 2009. They said its value dropped about $5 million from over $12 million to about $7.5 million in 2010. The changes saved the Romneys more than $100,000 in property taxes over four years. But they're not the only ones to request tax breaks. About 250,000 county homes have been reassessed since the market crashed. Affordable housing advocates in San Diego celebrated an anniversary today, but they are using it as a call to action, as we hear from KPBS Metro reporter Katie Orr. 
Ten years ago today, the San Diego City Council took action to make it easier to build affordable housing developments like this one. But a decade later, housing advocates worry that the city has lost focus, and they say it's time to make affordable housing a priority again. Single mom Patricia Bird is one of at least 30,000 people waiting for affordable housing in San Diego. She says she's applied at 15 different developments over the past four years. She says she's been told it will be another four years before she gets something. Affordable housing will provide my children a clean and safe environment, one where I would not have to worry about mice and roaches and because of the landlord neglect. San Diego is a great need of much more affordable housing projects where people in need don't have to wait as long as eight years to get into a house. There has been a lot of new affordable housing development here in the barrio, but it's not enough. Many families are still waiting for housing. Recent changes mean those families may have to wait even longer. Susan Riggs Tinsky is the executive director of the San Diego Housing Federation. She says many of the measures put in place 10 years ago have been eroded. Housing advocates are also scrambling to find more money now that their largest source of funding, redevelopment agencies, have been eliminated by the state. Tinsky says she hopes the incoming council will recognize the problem. The city council has been very focused on um, you know, fixes to the pension and you know, um, creating a, um, you know, a, a better Balboa Park and, and things like that. And you know, our hope is that this incoming city council will be able to refocus its efforts now that it has some of those issues um, dealt with and will be able to kind of prioritize affordable housing over some other less immediate issues. Among their requests, Housing advocates want San Diego to increase fees commercial developers pay that go toward affordable housing. The fees have not been increased since 1996. You may recall all those political mailers stuffed in your mailbox from the June primary. Well, the next election cycle is revving up, and you could soon be inundated with more political ads. There is one type of campaign mailer especially tricky. Some might even say deceptive. Our investigations desk takes a look at slate mailers. A couple months ago, San Diego County elected a new Superior Court judge to the bench. His name is Gary Creep. He's gained some infamy around the county and the country as a birther. That is, someone who believes President Barack Obama may not be a citizen of the United States. Here's what Creep had to say about the president's birthplace on KPBS Evening Edition in June. Do you think Barack Obama is a citizen of the United States? I have sincere doubts. According to his paternal step-grandmother, who stated in a, in a published statement, a recorded statement, that no one has ever disputed, he was born in, in uh, Mombasa, in what is now Kenya, and she performed a Zulu birth ritual on him. Now, why well, despite that belief, Creep paid to be on campaign flyers linking him to the president. Joining me to explain why, I, news source reporter Ryan Grahowski and political scientist Carl Luna. Thank you both for being here. Nice to be here. Ryan, let's begin by talking about the campaign mailer Gary Creep was on as well as the president. Sure. It's called a slate mailer, and it's a type of political advertisement. Now, the uh, county, city, Democrats and Republicans put out slate mailers saying these are our suggested candidates. But most of them are actually from uh, for-profit companies that uh, candidates pay to be on there. And they're often associated with, uh, like I have one here, with COPS Voter Guide or Coalition for Literacy. It generally put around a certain type of you know, belief that all of these candidates support the same thing, but it's actually just a business that candidates paid to be on. So, Carl, why would a candidate who, let, let's take Creep, for example, who, who opposes the, the president's even presidency, why would he pay to be on a campaign mailer alongside with him? Votes. You get on a campaign mailer, people see your name, you get name recognition, it gets to a lot of households. It's a cheap way, all things told, to get into a lot of households. And you pick up votes by association. The one that says cops, you see that, you think this person likes cops. You put out one with puppies and mothers on it, people think they love mothers, and you'll vote for them. That's what it's all about, just getting votes. Isn't the point, though, of, of this campaign literature is to inform voters, this is what I believe in, this is what I think, isn't that the point of sending these out? No, the point is to get votes. Yeah, if you can get votes by dealing into your record, fine. If you can get votes by association, fine. If you can get votes by scaring people about the other guy, fine. It's all about winning the election.
Now, Ryan, are there rules? Is this legal? Can they do this? Yes, slate mailers are legal and they are regulated by the Secretary of State. So there are generally two guidelines, two rules that slate mailer companies have to abide by. One, they have to report all of their financial statements with the Secretary of State. So anybody can go on that Secretary of State's website and look up their financial reports, see how much, how they're charging for candidates and what they're spending. Second, every slate mailer needs to have a small little disclaimer on it saying, one, that these candidates paid to appear on here. If they did, they have an asterisk by their name. If they didn't, there isn't one. And also that uh, if they appear on this mailer, doesn't mean that they're endorsed or uh, have anything in common with these other candidates. And, and we're looking at that right now, actually, yeah. this fine print. This is very small type mm -hmm. and, and probably at home so small you can't even read it, so let me help you out here. Now, it says this document was produced by Election Digest. Appearance is paid for and authorized by each candidate and ballot measure, which is des designated by an asterisk, not paid for and not authorized by each candidate, not designated by an asterisk. So you've got to look for that asterisk. Yes, you do. So, Carl, how do voters tell the difference between what might be a very legitimate campaign mailer that say the Republican Party puts out or the Democrats put out and something like this it's really hard it, now you have to look at the the titles if it says Republican uh, Central Committee Republican Party it says Barack Obama I endorse this message it's a candidate it's a party ad but most of these you're gonna look at them in the time it takes to go from the mailbox to the trash you get about three four seconds of recognition on it and that's what they're going for Make that association, Gary Creep, Barack Obama, Gary Creep, Dianne Feinstein, and may, may pick you up enough votes in a close race to win. L let's get back to Gary Creep then, Ryan. Were you able to speak to him about him appearing on this mailer with the president? Uh, no, uh, we tried to contact him. I don't think he was interested in, in this um, story, but uh, so we don't know if he even knew that he was going to appear on uh, one of these with Barack Obama. But uh, in general, I found that superior court judges do use these as a main way of advertising and getting votes for the election because they're cheap and, you know, like Professor Luna said, even if it just gets you a couple hundred votes, they're small races. Those hundred votes could uh, make the difference. Okay, well, thank you both for being here. And I want to send people to our website because I know they can look at an example firsthand mm -hmm. and also read more on your uh, in your story at kpbs.org. Thank you. A San Diego Marine was laid to rest today, nearly 40 years after he was reported missing in action. Private First Class Richard Ravenberg was 21 when he disappeared off Cambodia's coast in 1975. His remains were recovered in 2008. They were identified this year and finally buried at Rosecrans National Cemetery today. The Defense Department says more than 83,000 Americans are still missing. Gas prices continue to climb. They've gone up nearly 20 cents a gallon in less than a month. The average price for unleaded in San Diego County now $3.87 a gallon. Plans to install 1,000 car charging stations around the county are a year behind schedule. They were supposed to be in place last December, but the company is having trouble finding places to put the stations. Ecotality says businesses don't want to give up parking spaces to make room. So the company is negotiating with the city to put charging stations in public rights of way. Owning a car is a little like owning a house. It's part of the American dream. But our relationship to the car may be changing even in car-dependent San Diego. KPBS reporter Tom Fudge tells us about a trend called car sharing. A few of the electric cars that make up the car to go fleet in San Diego parked outside the Sea Rocket Bistro last month in South Park. These cars can be rented by the hour or even by the minute for trips in central San Diego. The promotional event attracted some potential customers and some committed car sharers like bistro owner Dennis Stein. He says when he needs a car, there's almost always one nearby. So basically I pull out my phone, I go on their car to go app, it shows me a map, and I'd say 90% of the time there's one within five blocks of here. Stein does not own his own car. That means he has no car payments, no car insurance payments, and no cost of vehicle upkeep. 
As to convenience, Stein says car sharing works. The combination of car to go with my bicycle is, and borrowing cars from friends occasionally is more than enough, and it's really worked out well. car to go is just one company in the short-term car rental business. Zipcar is another, and this Zipcar is parked right across the street from KPBS on the San Diego State campus. In order to unlock the car, you hold your member card up here. To start it, you grab this key that's tethered to the dashboard, and your car rental begins. Zipcar and Cardigo charge customers between $8.50 and $13 an hour. Cardigo says it currently has more than 6,000 members in San Diego County. Other companies facilitate the sharing of private vehicles. Sign up with GetAround.com and you join a network of people interested in either renting your personal car for a while or offering you theirs. But cost savings and convenience aside, the desire to help the environment is a clear motivator for people who car share. Studies by the Victoria Transport Policy Institute, among others, show car sharing means fewer cars on the road and fewer miles traveled. Robin Chase is the former CEO of Zipcar. But for me, the one that I really most love of environmental benefits is that when you pay by the hour and by the day, you drive 80% less because now you're really cognizant of precisely why should why and how should I take a car instead of some other mode? Elise Lowe is the executive director of Move San Diego, which lobbies for alternative transportation. She says car sharing has filled a void for San Diego transit users. Public transit doesn't fit for everyone. Um, sometimes it just doesn't get you where you need to go in the time. People in San Diego are, are used to driving a car. They're used to having that, that flexibility and really being able to call the shots on um, getting from point A to point B in a set amount of time. Car sharing fills that void for you without having to own your own car. For Howard Blackson, using car to go didn't mean going carless, but it did mean his family of four could get along by owning only one car. Blackson uses the service for occasional business trips from his downtown office. He says car to go has basically become his second car. Like I said, I really only need to use the car to go to meetings downtown, down on the waterfront, over in um, Mission Hills or over in North Park that's just a little too far for me to walk and I have access to a car. You have to realize that there are options out there and with just a little bit of effort you can actually try something that will save you money and actually be better for the environment as well. In San Diego the concept of car sharing is still pretty small. Zipcar primarily serves people at local universities and the zone where you can use and drop off a car to go doesn't go north of Mission Bay Park and it doesn't go east of I-15. But people think the concept of having a car handy that you can rent by the hour or by the minute will eventually mean you don't need to own one. You just use it when you need it, and then walk away. KPBS reporter Tom Fudge, the car sharing concept is growing. Zipcar has locations around the country and internationally. San Diego Museum of Art is being linked to an elaborate hoax on the U.S. Attorney's Office. Peggy Pico takes a closer look at the story. San Diego news organizations got a fake press release from the U.S. Attorney's Office last week that claimed local pharmacies would be shut down because of drug abuse. Since then, we've learned the hoax came about in a workshop sponsored by the San Diego Museum of Art. Americans for Safe Access, a political activist group based in San Diego, admits responsibility. Here to talk about the potential legal ramifications of the hoax is Glenn Smith, constitutional law professor at California Western School of Law. Glenn, the activist group that's responsible for this uh, hoax, they're under investigation. Do we know what for? Well, all we know, I, I'm not part of the investigation or haven't ever worked as a prosecutor, but I, from what I read from the press release, the uh, U.S. attorney talked about uh, under investigation for the crime of impersonating a federal official, specifically a federal law enforcement official, which is a cr federal crime. So they have to make that point. We'll talk about that a little bit further. But first, I want to say that we actually asked the Safe Access Group, the Art Museum, workshop attorneys to come onto the show and they did decline a request for an interview. The workshop was run by a political activist group called Yes Men. It's not their first time fooling the media. Take a look at this clip when a reporter questions an activist posing as a high-level HUD official. There are some saying that this is a farce, that you're not truly with HUD and that this is not an actual announcement. 
Well, they can say whatever they want. Who are these people? Where is your office? In Washington. Where in Washington? He did just he just joined the agency from France. He's a from France. Yeah, he's been a special uh attaché to the Department of the Interior in France. I mean, why why are you so skeptical? So Glenn impersonating a HUD official and here in San Diego, obviously a fake letter from the U.S. Attorney's Office. Are hoaxes like this, these legal? Well, as you won't surprise you, it, it really depends in part on the context. Certainly the literal crime says impersonating a federal official and taking one action, even a minor action, consistent with that is enough for the crime. When you have, though, the element of political speech and out outrageousness and the kinds of uh, falsity and drama that we traditionally in First Amendment law allow room for, it, it gets a little more complicated. Tell us about political speech. Where is that leeway? Where is that boundary? Well, there are no absolutes in freedom of speech and, and rarely in law. So certainly you have a right to make false statements. You have a right to pretend you know, sir, uh, Stephen Colbert has the right to pretend to be someone in order to make a political point. But when it collides against a, a law, uh, like impersonating a federal officer, or uh, you, nobody has the right, for example, to extort money from someone under false pretenses, even if it's for a political reason. So it, it gets, it's a gray area. What about the San Diego uh, Museum of Art? They paid for this workshop. Are they legally responsible in any way? That's an even more complicated question. There, you know, theoretically, there might be aiding and abetting liability under the law that makes it a crime to impersonate an official, but there's a lot of, presumably, a lot of intent requirements and other requirements. You'd have, the, more you, the more you walk back from the actual crime uh, to people that may have facilitated it in some way, it gets even more complicated. What's going to be the major issues in trying to prosecute a case like this? Well, you know, again, I'm, I'm not a prosecutor, but I would just think that they would go through three basic questions that any prosecutor would. And the first is, what are the facts here? And that's why, in, without knowing the investigation, you can't really, really comment. But you know, are the facts enough to make a sound claim that I would be willing to even charge or, and potentially take to a jury? And then there is this additional sort of constitutional question. I think in the recent uh, Stolen Valor Act about, about falsely claiming to have a military medal, I think the Supreme Court signaled that they would allow this kind of a law. But whenever you get in this free speech area, you got a question. But then there's the ultimate question, which is, is it worth the, the time of the office? And is it worth uh, making maybe, maybe making sympathetic figures out of these people who have been annoying my office to begin with? <laughs> Um, do you see any room for this type of political hoax activism in, in the political arena? Is there a place for this in, in our society? Oh, well, there, there is. I mean, that's the, what makes this somewhat complicated. Not this particular thing necessarily, but there's a time-honored tradition of, of hoaxes, you know, or stunts, the Boston Tea Party, et cetera, that, that w has been recognized and to a certain extent protected in free speech law. But on the other hand, you've got to protect people's legitimate interests not to be you know, falsely parting with their money or misled or give information to people they think are federal officials. So it's, it's a delicate balance, but there definitely is a room for falsity and hoaxes and satire, and uh, hopefully there always will be. Okay, we will be following this. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Well, as you, as you heard, a big celebration at NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab after a perfect landing on Mars by the Curiosity, the rover, now at work exploring the red planet, sending back pictures from cameras built by San Diego's Malin Space Systems. NASA hopes Curiosity will help them learn whether Mars ever supported life.
Tonight in the public square, there was a difference of opinion in the comments on our story about the state's plan to impose a new $150 fee on rural residents for fire protection. San Diego County Supervisor Diane Jacobs said the county will sue the state if it moves forward with the plan to collect an additional $10 million a year from residents. SD County FFPM posted this in part on our website. $10 million a year is far below what most other counties in the state spend for fire prevention and and protection. The user Harry Street responded, I say no, this is simply another tax we'd be allowing the government to use. You can weigh in on this conversation or other stories you've seen here on KPBS by following us on Twitter, liking us on Facebook, or you can email us at publicsquare at kpbs.org. Recapping tonight's top stories, San Diego's Sikh community plans a prayer service for the victims of Sunday shooting in Wisconsin. Six people died when a gunman opened fire at a temple in Oak Creek, and the gunman was killed by police. The PBS NewsHour will have the latest on the shooting in just a few minutes. Housing advocates want San Diego City Council to refocus on providing more affordable housing. It comes on the 10th anniversary of the Inclusionary Housing Ordinance, giving developers a choice between a fee or setting aside 10 percent of their developments for low-income housing. And gas prices keep going up in San Diego County, up nearly 20 cents a gallon in the past month. The average for unleaded in the county, $3.87 a gallon. And you can find tonight's stories on our website kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thank you for joining us. Have a great night.